I only have 10 minutes to talk about a topic that needs 10 hours, America's impending fiscal disaster. Uh, the good news is that Johan covered some of it. Uh, I actually hate going after Johan. I have this annoying New York accent, and uh, Johan has that very suave European, what is it, Danish? No, it's Swedish. I, th those are fighting words if you call him Danish. Uh, but. But I do have an important topic to talk about, and let me just go ahead and throw out a couple of numbers to give you a sense of where we are right now. When Bill Clinton left office, the federal government spent 18.2 percent of GDP, our economic output. Whatever we produced, and uh, when Bill Clinton left office, the federal government was grabbing 18.2 percent of it and redistributing it, most of it, of course, in a very inefficient and harmful way. And we thought Bill Clinton was a big government enemy. After eight years of Bush, with Republicans in control of the House and Senate for three-fourths of that time, what happened? The federal budget virtually doubled from $1.8 trillion to $3.5 trillion, and federal government spending as a share of GDP, which is probably the best way of actually trying to measure the fiscal burden of government spending on the federal level, went up to about 24 percent of GDP. An enormous increase, an unprecedented increase. Obama comes into office promising hope and change, and what does he do? He gives us exactly the same spending policies as Bush. Uh, Bush gave us a so-called stimulus in 2008 that didn't work. Obama gives us a stimulus in 2009 that didn't work. Obama gives us government-run health care. Bush gave us a prescription drug entitlement. Uh, it actually made my job very easy because I went back into all my papers, I crossed out Bush's name and I wrote in Obama's, and I got to pretend I was working hard when all I was doing is changing a couple of names. But all this bad news that we've seen in the last nine and a half years is actually just the tip of the iceberg. If you go to the Congressional Budget Office website, which I don't actually usually recommend, uh, and you look at something called their long-run budget forecast, they do something going out 75 years, and let me give you a giant caveat. The government forecasters usually don't even get next year right, so give a, have a huge grain of salt about whether or not their 75-year forecasts are right. But a lot of it is just based on demographics. What do we have in terms of entitlement programs? What's going to happen to the American population? How fast is it, is it aging? How many younger workers, or i.e. younger taxpayers, are coming into the system? You, if you look at those long-run 75-year Congressional Budget Office forecasts, which certainly are probably wrong, but we don't, we don't know whether they're too optimistic or too pessimistic, they estimate that federal government spending, which today is around 25 percent of GDP, by the time we get out 50, 60, 70 years, is going to be 45 and 67 percent of GDP. That's just on the federal level. 45 percent to 67 percent of our economic output will be consumed by federal government spending, just the federal level. You add in state and local government, which right now is around 13 percent of GDP, it'll certainly be higher over time, and you can see that we're going to be somewhere between 60 percent and more than 80 percent of GDP consumed by government. Heck, even Johan's home country doesn't have government spending of more than 60 percent of GDP. Oh, and I guess we're all going to be eating uh, cod and, uh, and uh, you know, herring and stuff like that. We'll all be Swedish uh, if that happens. But of course, what does that mean? If we have a federal government that big consuming that much of our economy, it almost certainly means we're going to have a giant tax burden as well. And I want to talk a little bit about what comes along with this impending fiscal disaster, which almost certainly will be a value-added tax. This is, our, this is our Armageddon battle. Senator DeMint said uh, Obamacare was Waterloo. Well, we lost Waterloo. We've now been exiled to, what, uh, St. Helena? Uh, I'm not quite sure on my European history. Uh, but. That's just one thing. Now we're having to look at what are they going to do to finance all this giant government spending that's coming down the pike. Now, if you look at the evidence from Europe, they put in value-added taxes 
oftentimes claiming that they were just replacing inefficient national sales taxes, oftentimes claiming that they were going to reduce or lower or get rid of other taxes, oftentimes claiming that this wasn't a plan to increase the burden of government spending, it was just a plan to make the tax system more efficient. In other words, all the rhetoric we're seeing out of Obama's so-called Deficit Reduction Commission, all the rhetoric we're seeing out of people like Paul Volcker and the politicians on Capitol Hill that are salivating for a value-added tax, they're making the exact same argument we saw in Europe 25, 30, 40 years ago when the VATs were first put in. What does the evidence show from Europe? If you go back to 1965, before Europe had value-added taxes, and you look at the OECD data about what was the size of government, what was the size of the tax burden, you will see that government spending and taxes as a share of GDP were maybe a couple of percentage points higher than what we had in America at the time. Now, since 1965, government has gotten bigger in America, and the tax burden has increased in America. But in the grand scheme of things, not that much. We've gone up a couple of percentage points of GDP. We've moved in the wrong direction, but heck, in some sense, that's a victory. We held government in check, relatively speaking. In Europe, government spending exploded and the burden of taxes went up along with it. And if you look at some of the claims of the VAT proponents, well, at least this was a better way of raising taxes, a less destructive way of raising taxes. What do you see when you look at income tax rates? What do you see when you look at the burden of income and profits taxes as a share of GDP in Europe? They've gone up, not down. Tax rates actually since about the mid-1980s have come down because of tax competition, but the overall burden as measured by a share of GDP of income and profit taxes in Europe have gone up. So if we get a value-added tax in America, I can state with 99.99% confidence that we will see exactly what happened in Europe. The giant, bloated federal government that we will have will be matched by a new disturbingly and dangerously efficient tax collection mechanism known as the value-added tax, and then we will be in a position where there is no fundamental fiscal difference uh, between America and Europe. And what does that mean? Well, there's a reason why today America is about 30 percent richer than Western Europe when looking at measures such as per capita GDP. There's a reason today that America is about 40% richer than Europe when looking at measures of average individual consumption, which actually looks at disposable income, uh, which means that reflects uh, the higher tax burden in Europe. We are richer and more prosperous than Europe because we have not made the same mistakes Europe has made. But now we're doing that. The Bush-Obama policies of big government are a down payment on this entitlement tsunami that is soon going to sweep over America, and the value-added tax is just a way of letting the politicians know, go hog wild, you have this giant new source of revenue, go ahead and spend to your heart's content. If that happens, it'll happen over the dead body of the Cato Institute. That's my pledge to you. Thank you.